Hi everyone, so my name is Xiao Feng Feng from the physics department. But actually I'm doing some chemical research. This is all like enabled by the reactor cluster. Is like the reactor cluster is for renewable energy and the chemical transformations. And uh, so today I would like to share like my research about electrochemical fuel synthesis, which hopefully can reduce our reliance on fossil fuels. So talking about like fossil fuels, we all know that you know we have very limited reserves of fossil fuels in our earth. And so these are the data from the BP, and they, from their estimation, there are only like roughly 50 or years of like reserves left for these like oil and natural gas and a little more for coal. But although there may be new discoveries of these like you know reserves, but still there are limited reserves of fossil fuels, and sooner or later we have to turn to renewable energy sources. And then what are the most like promising renewable energy sources? Typically we refer to the solar energy or wind energy. And for the solar energy or wind energy, we already have quite a mature technology like the, like the solar panels or wind turbine that can convert the energy into electricity. And then for this renewable electricity, they are, it's, it's great, but this renewable electricity has an intermittent supply. For example, you don't have the electricity supply in the night if you are using solar panels. And that means you need to store the renewable electricity in some like a uh, format so that you can use the energy flexibly. One way is the batteries, but the batteries cannot be used everywhere. As I will show, we actually, our society has heavily relied on chemical fuels, like the gasoline we added to our tank. And then one idea is to store the renewable electricity into the chemical fuels. And so that we can have the chemical fuels like that is compatible with our current energy infrastructures. And in addition, the renewable electricity can also be used to synthesize some very important like chemicals like ammonia. Ammonia is very important like in our world because it's used, many used to produce agricultural fertilizers. So that we can have enough food production, right? In the farms to feed the world's population. And then this process, nitrofixation fixation process, which is converting nitrogen to ammonia is highly energy consumptive, which consumes like three to 5% of world's natural gas production. That means eventually we are running out of natural gas. We have to use alternative energy source to like power this chemical reaction to produce ammonia. And another example I want to use is this like CO2 recycling. And as we know, we have been heavily relied on the fossil fuels in past one or two centuries. So that we now like release too much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So that we are having uh, like a global climate issue. One idea is to use renewable energy, renewable electricity to recycle carbon dioxide so that we can help mitigate the global climate issue. So these are the background. Then like fundamental challenges in these like, like technologies are one is a catalyst, and we need a very high catalyst, catalyst with high activity, high stability, and high selectivity. And on the other hand, we also need to develop efficient devices called electronizers, and mass transport is one of the critical issues in such devices. So uh, considering the, the, the background of the audience, I want quickly to show you the like, catalyst. So we all know catalyst is something to help, and, but then why do we need a catalyst to promote a reaction? So here are the very simple example. If you have two molecules react to form a new compound, and typically, if it just let them occur like freely, they may have a very high energy barrier in this reaction process. But if you introduce a material like a metal, precious metal, and the molecules can absorb on the surface, crack, and then reorganize, like diffuse and rearrange so that they can form the products and then dissolve. With this medium, like the catalyst, we can largely reduce the energy barrier so that we can have a much higher reaction rate. And, but if you look at, into the catalyst material, like a metal, you will find that, okay, they have very different atomic like, uh, structures on, in the surface, on the surface. And like the one shown here, each ball means an atom, metal atom. And so this is a different atomic scale vision. And you have terrace, you have some step atoms, you have some kinky atoms. As I will show you one example later, these atoms are still quite different from each other. So we want to have atomic understanding of these relationships between the atomic structure and the 
chemical catalytic activity. So that we can use the knowledge to design highly active catalytic materials. So talking about the catalytic material, typically we design metal nanoparticles. Why? Because the nano size can give you a very high surface area to volume ratio. So that you can have like a high surface area to, for the reactions. And typically in the field, people try to control the composition, for example, make a noise, control the size or control the shape of the nanoparticles. And in my postdoc, I discovered that the gram boundaries, a type of defects in a metal nanoparticles can contribute significantly to the reaction. And then here, I want to show you like the two recent like studies or serious studies I discovered. One is this palladium metal, which is unique because it can form a palladium hydride under reaction conditions, which means hydrogen atoms can enter into the palladium metal and which are actually promoting the, the reaction. So in our studies, we typically synthesize or prepare the metal nanoparticles. We characterize them sometimes ex situ, sometimes in situ, which means at, in the working conditions. And also we test the catalytic performance and understand the relationships between the structure and activity. And of course, this is just a quick thread, but sometimes we have to try multiple rounds until we find the most important structure like a factor or most important structure like a parameter. And here, one example is for the palladium. We prepared the palladium nanoparticles and these, these are the uh, TM images to visualize the nanoparticles. And we even use advanced techniques that you know, called operando X-ray X absorption spectroscopy that can only be performed in the national lab like X-ray facilities like the SNAP, which is where I did this like, you know, study. And after the characterizations, we eventually we need to understand the mechanism, mechanism. And with the help from my collaborators, we find that, okay, these bulk atoms in this like palladium hydride can actually significantly contribute to the reaction rate. So that the reaction rate of the hydrogen to ammonium can be largely increased. This is one of the example. And another example is like for the particle size. And in this study, I collaborated with Dr. Perga Banerjee, like, uh, at the UCF, like, and we use also atomic layer deposition technique, a technique also introduced by Tateo earlier, and we can control the size of the nanoparticles. And then, these are one of the examples of nanoparticles. We have relative uniform size. We find that, okay, the activity like, has critical dependence on the particle size, and four nanometers particles seems the best. While if you have a double size, for example, roughly eight nanometers, the activity dropped by almost five to six fold, which means if you just unfortunately have a little slightly larger nanoparticle, they are just almost like a far less effective. So what's behind this is again, we look into the atomic scale. We find that for ruthenium, a hexagonal closed packed metal, and it has a quite complicated atomic structures. But here we use different colors to choose different phases, like these phases, and these three different type of edges, like this H, H B, H of and like DH. And we find that after D5, we, we call D5 because it's five symmetric, five fold symmetric. And this D5 step side actually is the most active side for this reaction. And this D5 side is like in this orange color, which the, the ratio of this D5 step side decreases rapidly with the particle size. So that the particle size is, is very critical in our situation here. And after showing the two examples of these metal nanoparticle structure activity relationships, I also want to show you like what kind of device we use to test the nanoparticles for the reaction. These are the most simple cell that are generally used in the field called the H cell, which means you have two like pieces of glassware separated by a membrane and you have a catalyst in this like a working electrode. You bubble CO2 or nitrogen into the cell. But as you can see, the nitrogen or CO2 has a very slow uh, diffusion and a very low stability in the electronite, which means this will greatly limit, it, limit the reaction rate. So what in the field is we develop a new type of device called gas diffusion electrode flow cell. And behind the different cells is, okay, for the gas diffusion electrode cell, we have a particular electrode that can separate the gas and liquid phases so that gas can directly diffuse to the catalytic particles for the, re to, for the reactions like you know, much, in a much faster, much higher rate. But this is not enough. Our recent studies, we find that, okay, if you can add some hydrophobic PDFE nanoparticles inside the catalytic nanoparticles, around the catalytic particles, we can, which can trap gas bubbles, but also repel liquid. 
in around the nanoparticles, which means we are controlling the micro environment. And with this control, we can greatly increase the reaction rate by almost like a one fold. And behind this study is that, okay, we create a hydrophobic micro environment just by adding some hydrophobic inert PDF nanoparticles. We can have a balance between the gas and liquid phases so that we have highly efficient mass transport in the reaction of CO2 or nitrogen. And so with these examples, I showed that, okay, we can, I, I mainly focus on studying the uh, metal nanoparticle catalysts as well as the, the electrode and electronizers, the design for these efficient conversions of these molecules to chemical fuels. Okay, and I want to thank like my group members, my postdoc and my students, also like my converters, like, you know, the external converter from Virginia Tech and also Dr. Peregrine Banerjee, Dr. William Caden, Dr. Titia Juka, and also Gan Chen from UCF. And the research I mainly supported by a startup grant as well as three external grants. And I want to thank you for your attention. And uh, I think I still have four minutes for questions. 